All right. Um, so initially, I was contacted by the Angular team because we, we hear these questions from them all the time. It's like, so what about search? And what do Angular sites need to do with search? Because there are lots of weird, from our point of view, misconceptions out there specifically around search. Um, it starts with things like this. We see this all the time. JavaScript hurts your SEO. So if you're using Angular, of course, this hurts your SEO, right? According to the headlines. It gets even worse. Maybe Angular is even killing your SEO. So good to watch out for this. Um, and this is one that, that particularly hurts. It's like, well, these both come from the same company. How come it doesn't work together, right? And some people are getting really close to the truth. And they're asking, maybe this is due to those curly brackets. So I, I think from a search point of view, if you all just got rid of the curly brackets, then I'm sure SEO would just work. Well, I guess there are a few other things to, to look into. So just briefly about me, um, I've been with Google over nine years now. I work uh, mostly within search. I'm not an Angular developer. So most of the, the things we'll be going through here are focused more on search in general and JavaScript sites, uh, JavaScript frameworks in particular, and not specific to Angular. There is a brief section on, on Angular as well, though. And this is Googlebot on the side who will be joining us for the run of the presentation. All right, so I'll be looking at, in general, what search needs, uh, a bit about rendering, because this is a, a really big topic for us, really important. Um, quickly on what you could do to, to fix issues that you've run into so far, and some useful tools along the way. So. Looking at uh, the minimum requirements for search, um, one of the things that I thought is kind of useful to understand is briefly how search actually works. So how we work with indexing, how we pick up the content that we can show in the search results. And all of that essentially starts with uh, a bunch of URLs. And uh, we go off to the internet to look at these URLs. We try to render the pages to see what they actually look like kind of like a browser, and the content that we pick up there, we, we take on for indexing. So I think understanding these kind of steps, not particularly in detail, but uh, the steps themselves gives you a little bit of understanding of what you might need to watch out for when it comes to search. So in particular, uh, search, like I mentioned, starts with the URLs. So that's kind of the, the most important thing for us. So we really need to have unique indexable URLs for each piece of content that you have. And uh, when you talk with SEOs, they always say, oh, you need to put this on your page and that on your page. But uh, from our point of view, the URLs are the most important part. It's not really what's available on the page. And sometimes we can't even crawl the URLs, but we can still show them in search. Uh, so it's almost a bonus to be able to crawl the URLs, to find indexable content, and to pick up links. So links in particular are really important for Google because that's how we discover the rest of your website, the rest of your web app. So we start with your homepage, and then we see, oh, there are all of these links on the page. We will try to follow those to the, the individual pieces of content. So since we're talking about URLs, this is one thing that I see as being problematic with a lot of single page apps, uh, some of the, the Angular apps as well, in that uh, it's, it's really important to understand what's a good URL and what's a bad URL for Google. So we essentially look at the path and the file name. Parameters are fine if you have parameters as well. Uh, it's important that you have one URL per piece of content. So if you have multiple states within your app, within your website, then all of those states need to have individual pieces, of individual URLs. Uh, if you have translated content, so in English and German and French, then all of that needs to have separate URLs as well. Uh, bad URLs. So this is kind of an, an anti-pattern that we see a lot with, uh, with Angular sites sometimes, uh, with single page apps in general, uh, is that uh, either you have one URL for multiple states within your, your website, within your content, or you use a hash 
as a, as a way of identifying pieces of content within the website. So for us, if we see the, the kind of the hash sign there, then that means that the rest there is probably irrelevant and we'll, for the most part, we'll drop that when we try to index the content. So if you're developing locally and you use kind of the, the hash-based URLs to, to do that locally, that's fine. But when you push it to production, when you make it live, and if you want that content actually visible in search, then it's important that uh, you use kind of the, the more static-looking URLs. Uh, another anti-pattern that we see a lot is irrelevant URL parameters, essentially. So session IDs is something that used to be really common. Uh, something we still sometimes see is URLs that have uh, login information, for example, or any kind of private information. Uh, it's not that we'll go out and try to find these URLs, but they may show up in search. And then suddenly there'll be an article somewhere that's like, oh, if you do this weird Google search, you can find all of the login information for this website. So that's something to, to kind of avoid. OK, um, so canonical URL. Has anyone heard of canonicalization, canonical URLs? OK, some hands. OK, so I, I guess some of you have been uh, reading the, the SEO uh, type information out there. So this is one of our main things that we focus on when it comes to indexing content in search in that it's really common for websites to have multiple versions of their content available under multiple URLs. And uh, for us, it's important to find that one URL that's unique, that is kind of the canonical, the main key for this piece of content. Uh, so we try to do that automatically. For the most part, we do that really well. But you can take control of that as well on your side if you know exactly what type of URLs you want to have indexed. So you can use. Uh, link rel canonical elements. Uh, there's some other things here as well that you can do. Uh, it's really important for us that you're consistent with your canonical. So if you choose one URL as canonical or one type of URL, make sure you use that exact type of URL across your whole website so that we don't run into like multiple references to the same content in different ways. All right. Um, hash bang URLs, Ajax crawling. Uh, has anyone heard of this, implemented this? All right, some hands. Okay, great. So this was, a, I think, a really great idea back in the day. I, we, we came up with this 2008, 2009, where essentially Googlebot didn't have the capability to render pages. So we thought we would come up with a special scheme where if we recognized a kind of a hash in a URL, we would crawl it in a different way. And we would expect you to render the pages yourself. And we'll take that rendered version and use that for our index. So back in the day, this was a great thing to do because there were no real other options for JavaScript-based sites. Uh, but in the meantime, things have gotten a lot better. And there are, there are better ways to, to handle this. And additionally, we noticed over the years that this caused a lot of pain with webmasters because they had two versions of their site, essentially, that they had to maintain separately. And if there was an issue in the Googlebot version of the site, then that could cause problems in search that they would never notice when they look at the site themselves. So Googlebot has gotten better at rendering pages. Um, Essentially, in, in the meantime, Googlebot has gotten to, to be pretty smart with rendering pages, kind of like a browser. It has a fairly modern browser. It can, for the most part, render most modern websites well. But there are some exceptions. Uh, so th they're kind of listed here. On the one hand, there are specific elements that uh, are currently not supported, where you could use polyfills to kind of solve that. Uh, that includes promises, service workers, fetch API, local storage. These are things that, to some extent, don't really make sense for Googlebot to, to use either. So it's not that Googlebot would be able to run a service worker for every website out there and kind of keep that updated. We kind of expect you to function well without service worker support. So polyfills would work here, or uh, progressive enhancement, uh, graceful degradation techniques, that would be an option as well. Uh, we also don't fully support ES6. So if you're transpiling your code, make sure that you transpile it to ES5 if you need Googlebot to actually render the pages for you. 
Uh, finally, there's uh, the robots text standard that tells search engines which URLs they're allowed to crawl and which ones are, they are not allowed to crawl. And uh, for us to be able to render your pages properly, we need to be able to crawl all of the embedded content on your pages. And finally, one last thing that we sometimes see is uh, kind of this pattern of making clickable elements on a website that aren't really links. And for us, that's kind of problematic because we don't recognize those links, so we can't follow them to the rest of your content. So if you're making links between pieces of your website, then make sure that they render as A elements. So as I mentioned before, we try to render pretty much all of the pages that we crawl and index, which is a ton of pages. Um, but sometimes that doesn't work, which could be due to some of the, the things that, that I mentioned before. And in those cases where we can't render the content, what will happen is we'll fall back to the raw HTML version that you, do, that you serve us as well. So for single page apps, that could be problematic in that if we fall back to the HTML page, there is, for the most part, there's no real content on those pages. So what will happen there is we'll recognize all of these URLs as being duplicate because it's the same HTML that we receive. And over time, we'll fold all of those into one URL to try to solve the problem for the webmaster, which is probably not what you're trying to do. So this is one of those elements where if you recognize your page is dropping out of Google's index, then it might be that we're just not able to render them anymore and that we're falling back to the raw HTML version that we receive from your, from your website. Uh, another really important aspect when it comes to search engines is meta tags. Uh, for the most part, we don't need meta tags for ranking, but sometimes you need to tell us how you want these pages actually used. So you could restrict whether or not we show a cached link in the search results, whether or not this URL should be indexed at all. That's all something you can do in, in the head of a page and with meta tags. You can also link different language or country versions of your pages together, or you can link your desktop site to your mobile site if you have separate URLs for those. And for all of these, we require that these meta tags be in the head of the page. And sometimes we've seen uh, sites that have an HTML page that they deliver to us, but it has a script tag on top of the head that injects some content maybe. And after rendering the page, essentially the head is kind of broken. And the meta tags that we would see otherwise in the head, they slip into the body and then we can't take those into account for indexing. So this is something I'd kind of keep in mind and think about as you're building up your site and maybe test some of your templates that you have to make sure that they actually don't break the head of the pages. Um, a brief side note when it comes to rendering, this is a topic that comes up all the time. Uh, it's, we, we call it hidden text. Uh, for a large part, it's not uh, a webmaster trying to do something malicious and actually actively hide something on a page, but it's a UI element. So this could be a tabbed interface, for example. It could be something like a click to expand element on a page. And for us, when we render a page and we notice that some of the content is not visible by default, then we assume that it's not primary content and we'll kind of devalue it and search. So if there's something really important in a tab that someone has to click on to actually make visible, make sure that it's visible by default or move it maybe to a separate URL so that it can be indexed separately. And additionally, if you have something that's not even loaded by default, that requires an event, some kind of interaction with the user, then that's something we, we might not pick up at all because Googlebot isn't going to go around and click on various parts of your site uh, just to see if anything new happens. So if you have something that you have to click on, like, like this click to read more, and then when someone clicks on this, actually there's an Ajax call that pulls in the content and displays it, then that's something we probably won't be able to use for indexing at all. So if this is important content for you, again, move it to the visible part of the page or maybe move it to a separate URL. All right, so I mentioned Googlebot is really good at rendering, but sometimes rendering, like having Googlebot handle rendering can be a bit tricky because it's really hard to kind of debug what Googlebot is actually doing. 
Uh, so some sites render just for Googlebot. They serve Googlebot rendered content, which is similar to the Ajax crawling scheme. Um, from our point of view, this is sometimes tricky, and it leads to regular problems in that the indexing team will come to us and say, hey, you need to contact this big website. They're serving us rendered content, but it's totally broken. Uh, so this is sometimes really tricky to debug and to maintain. So our recommendation is to do pre-rendered content for all users, uh, which essentially is isomorphic JavaScript, which is something that uh, Angular Universal kind of lets you do as well. So the idea here is that you serve the pre-rendered content to all users when they come to your page for the first time. Googlebot can see the pre-rendered content immediately. Other uh, web services that interact with your website can see the pre-rendered content. And everything else is then taken to kind of the client side afterwards. All right. So fixing old issues is kind of easy once you've been able to to figure out what those issues are. Um, the, the first one I mentioned here is to really double check the non-Google dependencies as well, because this is something that we often see that people will say, oh, I will just fix all of these issues, and then they don't realize that maybe their share widget is completely broken after they fix things for Google. So really make sure that across the board you're not breaking other things while fixing things for Google. Uh, bring up the clean version. Make sure that the, the code actually renders. If you're changing URLs, then you need to set up some kind of redirects as well. So with regards to redirects, uh, for normal websites, it's fairly easy because you can just do server-side redirects. Uh, with uh, JavaScript sites, if you have a hash in the URL or hash bang in the URL, then you need to do that redirect on the client side with JavaScript. And for that, it's really important from our point of view, that you do that redirect as quickly as possible, that you don't have interstitials there, that you don't have a, a timeout that does the redirect after a certain period of time. Because what might then happen is we don't recognize that redirect. And we might say, oh, this is actually the content on the page. So the interstitial will pick up the interstitial for indexing. Uh, sitemap file is important. The sitemap file is a way to notify search engines of the, the URLs on your website when they last changed. So redirect, when redirecting, make sure to update the sitemap file for both the old and the new URLs. And of course, double check the robots text file. And one last thing that we also regularly see people uh, have trouble with uh, make sure you update all of the hidden URL references as well. So these are things that are not the immediate navigation within the website. But uh, for example, if you link the different language versions together, make sure that those versions also reflect the, the new URL structure. Or if you have a separate mobile site, that, that also refers to the right URLs uh, within your, your website. All right. So some useful tools. Search Console. I imagine a lot of you use Search Console. Can I get a quick show of hands? Search Console users, OK. A bunch. That's good. And I guess the others are, are just hungry and waiting for lunch. Um, but Search Console is, is a really great way to, to get insights into how Google sees your website, uh, to understand how the crawling process is working, how we're able to render content, how indexing is working. Uh, so I'd strongly recommend, if you're trying to do something to, to work in Search, make sure that you set up Search Console, that you understand roughly what all is involved there. Um, one good reason to be prepared with Search Console is also for urgent removals. We see this all the time in that people will accidentally put private content online. Uh, Googlebot will pick that up fairly quickly, and then you kind of have to scramble to get that removed. If you have everything verified in Search Console, then it's a matter of a couple minutes of actually just submitting that for removal, and then it's out of the index. So the most important tool for you is probably fetch and render in Search Console, where we send Googlebot to a URL that you specify, and Googlebot will try to render the page and show you what it looks like when, it, when it's rendered with Googlebot. 
So this is a great way to confirm that your pre-rendering is working well if you're doing that. Uh, you can test it with smartphone and desktop user agents to make sure that the mobile version is being picked up properly. It lists the URLs that are blocked by robots.txt, so it's a lot easier to figure out if you're blocking maybe an API on your server or some other server response, or if you're using an external API that's blocked by their robots.txt. That's something to, to kind of watch out for. Uh, the problematic part, maybe for some of you, is that for rendering, we show you a screenshot. We don't show you the full DOM of the page. So if there's something in the meta tags that's critical for you, then you might need to kind of um, do, do some hacks to, to actually make sure that Googlebot is picking that up properly. All right, uh, sitemap file is another one of those things that comes up regularly when it comes to search. In the sitemap file, you list uh, the URLs and the last change dates of those URLs. And uh, I recommend separating that out by route or by template or some logical structure that you have within your website that makes it a lot easier for you to debug issues that are systematic to one particular part of your site. So if you have product detail pages, then put all of those detail pages into one sitemap file. And then you'll see if there's a systematic issue with the, that template, then you'll see that fairly quickly. Um, the last modification date tells us when this page last changed, and we'll go off and try to recrawl it as quickly as possible. Afterwards, the, the other attributes in a sitemap file you can probably ignore. All right, so we kind of made it to the end. Uh, very quick summary, uh, in, in general with regards to URLs, I think URLs is kind of the, the most critical part here, especially when you're looking at single page apps, Angular apps. Uh, make sure that you're using clean URLs, no hashes in the URL. Uh, understand how Googlebot does rendering. Understand how you could do rendering on your side. Maybe check out Universal to, to see how that works. Um, for each route or template that you have set up on your website, kind of separate those out logically so that you can recognize systematic issues a bit faster, and then everything should just kind of fall into place, and you shouldn't have to worry about uh, all of those, I don't know, bad headlines around JavaScript sites in search. So with regards to Angular, if you're using Angular 1, make sure that you have HTML5 mode set so that you don't have the hash in the URL. Uh, with Angular 2, I believe it's already set up properly by default. And again, check out Universal. That might be something to look into as well. All right, uh, with that, I think we've kind of come to the end. Uh, if you have more questions, I'll be in the office hours uh, this afternoon. I also do regular office hours hangouts, uh, which you can join on, on YouTube or Google Plus Hangouts. And feel free to ping me on Twitter or Google Plus or wherever if you have more questions afterwards. <laughs>